the President of the United States and the Vice President of the United States. Thank you very much. Well, welcome to the White House. I'm delighted you're able to be here, and I know that you'll be meeting with the Vice President and Dave Stockman and I think Ed Meese, and, yes. And uh, as you know, I've transmitted to Congress my revised federalism package, which incorporates four major mega block grants to state and local governments. And this legislative, or these legislative proposals represent a continuation and an expansion of the efforts of the administration to return authority, responsibility, and revenue sources to state and local governments. You and I know that in two decades, between 60 and 80, we saw ever accelerating encroachment by the federal government on state and local prerogatives. Narrow and restrictive federal grants in aid programs grew in that same period of time from under 50 to more than 500. And such obvious local concerns were covered as rat control and sewer extension and a few other items of international <laughs> rating. The, the cost of the programs exploded from over $7 billion in 1960 to $95 billion in 1981. There's no question the federal government had too much control, the programs lacked flex flexibility, and regulations were restrictive. Federal mandates were depleting state and local treasuries. Expenditures were being made for programs that weren't really needed in particular communities and localities. At the same time, State and local officials began calling for a reordering of priorities, sorting out of responsibilities among the various levels of government. And I want to thank the NCSL Federalism Negotiating Team and the NS or CSL staff for the many hours of meetings and advice and assistance on this project. The package which has gone forward to Congress incorporates much of the input that we've received from you over the course of the past two years. It'll provide stable and certain funding source for state and local governments by guaranteeing funding for programs at levels enacted for fiscal year 1984. Not a vehicle for budgetary savings. It'll provide you the opportunity to establish at your option your own block grants. It'll provide far greater flexibility to state and local officials and it will provide a phase-in period and transition time to avoid dislocation of state and local governments. And let me say just a few words, if I could right now, about the economy. Our economic program is starting to pay off. The leading economic indicators are up for eight of the last 10 months, and the last increase was the highest single increase in 33 years. Inflation is down from double digits to an annual rate of 1.4% for the last six months. Interest rates have been cut in half from the 21.5% level when we took office. They're down to 10.5% now, the prime rate. Auto and steel industry are expanding and housing is skyrocketing. And I saw just a tiny little item that uh, didn't seem to get much front page attention that the steel industry has called back 20,000 of their layoffs. Uh, to work. Perhaps the, well, the stock market we know is setting new records also, but perhaps the most important, real wages are up and were up for 1982 and that was the first time in three years that they had not been going the other way. Now we recognize this has been a painful period of economic readjustment and many of your state budgets have been particularly hard hit, but nothing we will do more to create jobs and relieve the fiscal pressures in a strong, vibrant economy. And we'll continue to address our energy toward achieving that goal. But that's enough of monologue. I didn't come here really to do much of a monologue. I'd, uh, we'll have some dialogue, so I'll call on your president, Bill Passanati. Thank you, Mr. President.
May I, on behalf of the officers of the, of the NCSL and all of the members and the leaders of the NCSL and the staff, thank you once again for meeting with us. We haven't forgotten, sir, that you were the first sitting president that attended one of our national conventions. And as a member of the Federalism Negotiating Team, uh, we have spent many hours here in the White House talking to not only you, sir, but members of your staff. We thank you for the opportunity to allow us to express the concerns and the needs and the aspirations and the wants of all of these men and women who are here in this house with you today, sir. Uh, I'm not going to speak any further, sir, except if you wish, I will be willing to serve as sort of a, uh, an impartial moderator and maybe designate some members of the audience who would like to speak and ask your questions. I'd appreciate that very much, really. Stop the ball rolling, sir, with regard to our concern uh, concerning the 1984 fiscal budget and its impact upon us in the states. May I ask Deputy Speaker John Bragg of Tennessee to start off by making a statement. All right. Mr. President, we're happy to be here. Many of the leaders of the states have, are beginning to feel a great concern, sir, in the reduction of the federal income tax. If I can oversimplify it, most of the time in most of the states, the feds have developed, have leaned on the income tax. We in the state level have leaned heavily on consumption and consumer taxes, and people at the local level have leaned on the property tax. Uh, the reduction of the federal income taxes have in turn now turned the federal government's attention to consumer taxes and to consumption taxes. And what we are really concerned about, Mr. President, is that the federals may be invading and taking the prerogative and preempting the taxes which we have normally used in all of the past years, in which, as you know well know, when you were governor, we had to depend upon the consumption and consumer taxes. And we are afraid that our, our ability to use those taxes is going to be taken away from us. In addition, we are a little bit concerned that our state sales taxes and our state property taxes may be the exemptions we now enjoy in the federal income tax may be taken away from us, which would further hurt us at the local level. I wonder if you'd care to comment on that problem, sir. Well, all I can tell you is that I would be opposed and will oppose and fight any effort to further reduce by taking away uh, as legitimate deductions, uh, taxes that are paid at the other level. I think that a tax on a tax is, uh, it just isn't just. Um, the, I know that in the talk about uh, simplification, particularly of the income tax, which has grown so complicated that I think there is more of a resistance to the income tax from that angle than there is from the amount of tax. But, and so there has been talk, I know, conversation about that an economist saying that we should um, uh, tax uh, consumption rather than, uh, uh, than saving and so forth, or income. Uh, believe me, I am very conscious, and I'm glad that you mentioned this, and I will see that it, we continue to keep this in the forefront, that we should not be invading the areas that are already uh, taken. The federal government has preempted too many of the taxing uh, methods and too much of the taxing uh, that is done. When I was a young man getting my degree in economics, uh, dishonestly I might add, uh, the, uh, uh, the federal government was only taking uh, about less than a third uh, of, the, of the tax money. And uh, today it's the other way around. Uh, it's taking two-thirds and leaving only a third for the states and local governments. And I want to see us reduce our share so that we can get back to the place that there may be uh, at the local level, at the state level, uh, we will in a way have benefited you to the extent that by not preempting too much of the tax dollar, there is leeway for you if you find it necessary to raise taxes uh, to do so. So believe me, we'll keep that in mind. You had some over there behind you. <laughs> Maybe you better, yeah, you better come up here where you can uh, see the hands. Mr. President, Paul Coverdell, Minority Leader, Georgia. Uh, over the years, no one has expressed more concern about federal deficits than yourself. And as you know, there's grave controversy regarding your staunch belief of increased spending in defense. And I, we know of your concern for financial restraints I wonder if you would elaborate for us here the causes for your strong stand uh, 
on the defense budget. Yes, uh, and when I was campaigning, I'd like to call to your attention that I was repeatedly faced with a question, not only from the press but from audiences, that if it came to a choice between deficit spending uh, and national defense, which side would I come down on? And I said I would have to come down on the side of guaranteeing the national security. And as I've so often said, that budget isn't determined by us. That's determined by the fellows, the adversaries. They determine what you have to do to guarantee the security of the people, which is the number one responsibility of the federal government. Now these out-year deficits, which we're not happy about, over half of them are uh, the result of the recession, which no one anticipated, especially those economists that I mentioned earlier. When we were submitting our plans and our economic plan in January, there wasn't a person in the world that believed such a thing was going to happen as that big slump that hit us in July, the furthering of the recession that had started in 1979. But I think we've been making a mistake in talking about the budget, the defense budget in terms of cash. I want to assure you first that the Secretary of Defense has not been getting credit. In fact, I kind of took him on the other day about it. He had, before this year began, he had already found $41 billion in savings over the, a five-year period from the original five-year defense plan that we submitted in uh, February of 81. And this was in part due to the lowering of inflation, in part due to uh, better methods of procurement and better management methods. He's also proposing another $55 billion over the coming five years of savings over our original concept. And yet for some it is still too high. But what we must look at the defense budget on is not in terms of dollars. Look at it as a plan for the security of the United States and then say, not are you going to cut it by so many dollars, but look at it and say, which of these things that we're doing can we do without and still be safe? What will you give up in order to reduce the, the defense budget? And when you look at it that way and look at what our national strategy has to be to guarantee our security, all the points in which it is threatened, not just here in our own shores, but around the world, then I think you'll find that we have a fine and workable plan. And we'll continue to try and make savings. The thing I started to tell you about of my taking him on the other day was because I said that he really, he was, wasn't being very understanding of the political process. That if he had $41 million he could save, he should have left it in the budget and let the Congress find it. <laughs> <laughs> Senator Mitchell. My name is Harry Michelle. I'm president of the Ohio Senate. Uh, two years ago, you were gracious enough to invite us here to a similar gathering. And on that occasion, I raised the question to you, sir, that with a suggestion that your fiscal policies and your budget might very well devastate the states in the Midwest and the Northeast. And I suggested to you at that time, sir, that if you were going to spend an enormous amount of money on defense uh, spending, that we might uh, suggest targeting some of that defense spending toward the high unemployment areas and the brownfield areas where so many mills had shut down. And I come from the city of Youngstown. At that time, your response was that you thought that the program would be good, your program would be good for our states, first of all, and secondly, that targeting in that fashion would be implying the use of federal programs to implement social policy, and you did not agree that it ought to be done. I'm suggesting, sir, to you now that Ohio, among other states in that area, has been devastated. We have had among the highest unemployment rates in the country. The city of Youngstown a month ago did have the single highest unemployment rate in the nation. Our state, like so many others, is now being penalized with high interest rates on the, on the uh, cost of money that we're borrowing for unemployment compensation. Uh, we'll owe you $282 million by the end of next year on in interest alone on, a, on $2 billion plus that we'll have to borrow for unemployment compensation. Now, my suggestion again two years later, Mr. President, is can we conceivably target any portion of your jobs program to those areas where we have 12, 14, 15 percent unemployment or in those areas in my hometown that have 20 and 22 and 
27%. Well, we have two jobs bills. I just sent the second phase up uh, this morning in legislation to the Hill. And I think that some of those do give that consideration. In defense spending, it is true that you, your emphasis really has to be uh, where is the industry that produces the weapon you need and where you are going to uh, be able to get what you need rather than using it uh, in an employment way. And yet, because of subcontractors, no, we did do as much as we could in that line of trying to take that consideration in. Uh, but when you're going to build a B-1 bomber or something, you have to go where the airplane factories are that, are, that, are, that build them. Um, in these job programs, uh, we are, uh, we've included grants for extension of unemployment insurance, the federal level. We're suggesting some other uses of those funds. Uh, we figure that about half of this unemployment is structural. Uh, these are people that uh, will never go back to the jobs they had. If you look at some of the metropolitan papers on a Sunday and at the Help Wanted ads, you can see that in all this time of unemployment, there are still employers begging for people to fill vacant jobs, and the problem is there aren't people trained for those jobs. So much of our program is going to be aimed at training and at relocation. Uh, we are going to, we're proposing in one of those measures to work with you, the states, to maybe uh, you use some of that unemployment uh, insurance uh, as a, a voucher that a, a worker can take that voucher to an employer and uh, the employer will receive the money in return for hiring uh, the individual. And of course, there'd be protection to see that when that ran out, he wouldn't get rid of him and try to get another one of the same kind to get another voucher. We'd protect against that. We, I do know that those particular states like your own, and I was there, are hit and hit unusually hard because two industries, either one of which can cause a recession, automobiles and housing, were both hit by the high interest rates, by the, uh, the inability to fund a car and the installment plan or to get a mortgage for a home. Uh, we're hopeful that as the interest rates have come down, that this is, uh, well, it has made a difference. Housing is now, uh, almost back to a point that it, uh, uh, where it was in 1978, new housing starts, sale of new houses and so forth. When the automobile industry uh, had its recession, that of course translated to steel, which was very important in your state, as well as several, several others, to rubber, again important to your state, and the fallout spread. Uh, we know that unemployment is the last thing to come back as we come out of a recession. And yet, we have signs. Last week was the lowest um, in applications for unemployment insurance that we've had uh, in several years. The, uh, the drop in the percentage rate that did occur uh, uh, a month or so ago was an indication that at least they're beginning to feel uh, some of the economic comeback. I think that some of the answers to your problems, though, would be found in those two packages that we have sent up to the Hill and that we're waiting for. And uh, we're well aware of targeting aid, uh, which we must do, to those particular areas where that are the most hard hit. And we'll do what we can. Speaker, we have time for one more. Oh. Speaker Koch of New Jersey. How come there's always more hands up than there is time? <laughs> Mr. President, it was a very short question, but about the infrastructure, uh, that magic word. In the spirit of the new federalism, I think the states are very willing uh, and ready to do more for themselves, heeding your admonition. The question is whether we are able to. The traditional source of funding uh, capital projects was the bond market, but the federal deficit is uh, functioning as a pac man, sort of gobbling up available credit. So it leaves us with a significant problem that must be addressed. Well, I, I haven't commented on and uh, will wait uh, to see on that legislation, although Remember, we do have a problem also, that Pac-Man that you mentioned. Uh, we've got a problem with deficits that we've got to curb, or Pac-Man will just grow fatter. Um, and we have to watch what we can do from that standpoint. I thought the gasoline tax would be of some help, and uh, uh, 
in, while it is limited to transportation, uh, both mass transit highways and uh, airports, that that would have, be able to do something for that. The other thing is the increase, because of our own tax cuts, the increase in personal savings has added dramatically to the uh, private capital pool that is there for investment and I believe is going to <coughs> go a long way toward providing money over and above what Pac-Man is going to gobble up uh, for those deficits. So everything that we're trying to do here is aimed at the belief that the quick fixes of the past, the artificial stimulus to try and get something going again, only led every time to another recession two or three years down the road. And on a chart, you will see that every recession, then when it was over, you started from a worse position than you were before that, that recession. Unemployment remained higher, inflation was higher, and then the next recession, it kept on that same thing. And we think the answer is, and everything we're trying to do is aimed at getting the economy rolling again as the only long-range permanent way of getting us back on, on track. And uh, I know that the federal deficits threaten some of the money that is available uh, or bonding. I know also that part of your tax problems uh, and our own have been caused by a triumph in reality, so much of our taxing benefited from inflation. And as we reduced inflation much faster than we ever thought we could, everyone's estimates of the tax revenues they were going to get had to go down. If it's the sales tax, if it's a state income tax, uh, even property tax. In California, uh, while I was still governor, I instituted a plan for the state to subsidize local governments that were dependent on property tax because they weren't changing the tax rate. But in that booming inflation, the tax man was coming around every year and saying to that working man that had a $15,000 home, well, your home is now worth $75,000 and we're taxing it accordingly. And uh, that's what led to Proposition 13 in, in California. But I think it is, that's a pain we have to bear because I don't think we want to go back to inflation. In fact, I dream of the day when inflation becomes even a little bit of deflation. I want to see that first day that the prices aren't just only going up a cent and a quarter. I want to see the day when they're going down a cent and a quarter, and we'll all be better off. And I know. Well, I'm sorry about all the hands that are missed. This is where we have the press conferences, and the same thing happens there. Somehow I don't feel as bad about missing them as I do about missing them. <laughs> But, uh, can President, I, thank uh, you once again. All right, thank you all very much. So you feel properly sorry for me. My next appointment is with the dentist. <laughs>